Hello, Bible students. This is a book of Romans, chapter 3. Verses 1 through 6. What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way. Chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true. But every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? Paul is being actually very even-handed here, and his ultimate goal is to prove to both the Jew and the Gentile alike that they are all accountable to God. If the Jew thought that the Old Covenant raised him in divine favor above everyone else, he's telling them they shouldn't trust in that. And if the Greek thought that their philosophical prowess merited them any special knowledge, they have no reason to trust in that either. All men are on an equal plane with God and are accountable to God because God has revealed himself to them by whichever way he has chosen uh, to the Jew through the law of Moses and uh, to others through nature and life itself. Paul takes care here to talk about the corruption of both the Jew and the Gentile and he uses a dialogue method in this chapter to do it. He uh, pretends that he is answering questions um, in a method that will provoke questions and also get his audience to think. He argues as if someone has asked him a question and is arguing the answer in anticipation of the next question. Paul turns to his Jew Jewish audience as if to answer a question about circumcision in the beginning of chapter 3 and asks what advantage does the Jew have over other men in relation to the rite of circumcision. Not because of the act of circumcision do they have an advantage, he says, but because of their covenant with the one true God. So in verse 3, the scripture that is often used to discuss attitudes of unbelief, let's look at it in its context. Remember he's saying here to his Jewish audience and telling them that what if some did not follow the covenant and the rules of the law and did not believe the promises of Abraham and did not obey what they should have obeyed? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect or ineffective? I've used this scripture myself to discuss unbelief in general, and this is usually one of those go-to scriptures Christians use uh, concerning the uh, unbelief about the gospel. But no harm is done there in using it like that. But because even in its context, um, if a person does not believe what, what God has laid out for them, uh, the question is still the same. Does their unbelief make the gospel less effective and the answer is no so verse 4 here Paul says let God be true and every man a liar God is the one that is truth remember he's talking to his Jewish audience throughout the chapter and uses Old Testament scripture to do it actually uh, scripture they are familiar with and once again he is proving that the Jewish people are as guilty as other men a fact that seems to escape some of them and some did not believe that they were in the same class as other men. So Paul references here Psalms 51 and 4 to remind them of their own scriptures. Paul is asking here and also in verse 5 that if God is unrighteous to be angry with mankind to make a, a judgment against him, how can he judge anyone else? 
uh, through all the sin and corruption that he has talked about in the previous chapters, isn't God proper to make this type of judgment? What are we as a Jewish people <clears throat> going to say when God inflicts his wrath on us as well? And this is what he's asking them. That Are we going to say that he's unjust when it's we who have failed in our faithfulness to God? And he says, I speak as a man. Uh, he's talking, I'm speaking humanly. What are we going to say to God? How could God then judge the world? Which is how he ends verse 6. Verse 7. For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. Verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. In verses 7 to 9, Paul goes back to some of the arguments of the Jewish people against cleaning up their own act and continuing in their hypocrisy. Uh, arguments very familiar to his audience. Uh, many of the Jewish people would make the argument during that time that if we are wicked um, doesn't that show the magnitude and the mercy of God isn't that the contrast we're supposed to have with such a holy God and in verse 9 uh, he clearly states that no one has a leg up on the other person all men are under sin and uh, he goes back to this Old Testament scripture there is none righteous no not one Verse 11, there is none that understandeth, there is none that seek after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood destruction and misery are in their ways and the way of peace have they not known there is no fear of God before their eyes now in verses 11 through 18 it's obvious here that he is not talking about Christians or blood washed saints but again he is reminding his Jewish audience of sin and what it produces in those that are under the law. Starting at verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Verse 19 clearly says that whatsoever the law says, it speaks to those that are under the law and not under the grace and power of Jesus Christ. If we remember our New Testament uh, in St. John 1 and 12, the scripture says, To as many as received Christ, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. 
So there is power and grace that comes with Christ that they did not have under the law. So God says this uh, so that everyone who is outside of Christ will be righteously judged by God. So uh, verse 20 shows us uh, no person can be justified by outward ceremonial works of the law, including circumcision or anything else outward. The law was only a schoolmaster, the scripture tells us, and taught us about sin. So real righteousness comes through faith in Jesus Christ uh, as he ends uh, verse 22 and he begins to explain this. Starting in verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God. Now, having looked at all of these scriptures in their context, it's amazing to me how many people, many people that have actually gone to seminary school and are considered scholars of the Bible, come down to verse 23 and try to connect it with the current experience of a blood-washed Christian as if they, their life is to sin all the time, every day. And, and that is certainly not what this scripture is teaching. I've heard many people take this scripture and say, well, you know, we can't do any better than what we're doing because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're always coming short of the glory of God. Well, certainly in God's power and magnitude, we will never be God himself. We'll never be like God. We are all still wrapped in our human flesh we're still subject to the temptations of the flesh. Um, but to take this scripture in the context that is in where Paul is trying to explain uh, to the Jewish people that under the law all men are the same, uh, that Gentiles and Jews are completely alike and none of them is any better in their background, in their knowledge, in their um, their chosenness uh, as receiving the law. None of them are any, none of you all are any better than anyone else. Uh, and Paul comes down to verse 23 and says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This is just another way of him saying, look, I'm telling you, everyone is on an equal plane with God. None of you are any better than uh, anyone else. Um, to God, all people that are in sin are alike and need to be saved. And that is all he is saying with this scripture. And it's amazing how people take that and try to diminish the victory of the Christian experience with this scripture. So verse 23 really is one of the most used scriptures in the book of Romans. Um, but in his context, Paul uh, is only saying that the whole world is guilty before God and needs to be saved. And this is very plain if you look at the preceding verses. Uh, all of mankind has sinned and has fallen short of the glory of God. I'm going to read just a passage here from Adam Clark on this subject. Um, these men that have written these commentaries are certainly um, uh, more highly educated than I am uh, in scripture and so we'll we'll listen to what they have to say so Adam Clark says about this uh, passage here the simple meaning seems to be this that all have sinned and none can enjoy God's glory but they that are holy consequently both Jews and Gentiles have failed in their endeavors to attain holiness as by the works of any law. 
no human being can be justified. Also, just as a quick aside to all of this, uh, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, um, the translation, sometimes you'll see this translated in uh, different ways, past tense, present tense, um, and that is up to the translator how they translate it. So that's why I'm a real stickler for, you have to look at what it's being said in its context. Um, this passage has what's called a, a device called a historical present, um, and this occurs in the Greek to dramatize the event as if the reader were watching the event occur but some English translations render uh, historical presence in the English past tense and then others permit the tense to just remain in the present so it's really up to um, who is doing the translating and how they wish to translate it so that's why uh, we have to look at the context To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay. But by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. The rest of this chapter, chapter of verses 26 through 31 is, is very simple. Paul is simply asking some questions here. Um, the conclusion basically being that God will justify the circumcision through faith and the Gentile also through faith so that they are one. Thank you for joining us today at Living Waters Bible Study. Don't forget, read your Bible and pray every day and you will grow. If you have any questions, you can email me at grsem7 at gmail.com. God bless you is my prayer.